was the summer of 2014, and for my son's bar mitzvah present, just like many Jewish parents, we wanted him to bond with the Holy Land. Oh, it worked perhaps too well. My husband had stayed back at the hotel, and our friends, my son and I, had just stopped in a pharmacy. Run! Run to the bomb shelter, sweetie! Please! Please hurry! I didn't hear the sirens at first, but the Israelis did. They're used to hearing these things. We ran to the back of the storeroom. It was a 12 foot by 24 foot windowless bomb shelter. My heart's pounding. Boom! Boom! I hear and feel the percussion of the exploding bombs. I'm trying not to get sick. I look at my 13 year old son and I think I'll never forgive myself if something happens to him. That's an excerpt from a speech I gave to the Orange County Jewish Bar Association. It was the first but not the last time we had to run to a bomb shelter. Our adventure and my transformation is also the subject of my book, Blasted from Complacency, A Journey from Terror to Transformation in Israel. There is no chapter in a parenting book on what to do when a war starts and you're on a family vacation. Think touring extraordinary and sacred sites mixed with cowering in bomb shelters. I'm still trying to get over the Jewish guilt of taking my son to war for his bar mitzvah present. The impact of being human targets helped me understand the plight of Israelis living like this, and it also made me want to work on peace. How Israel is often described on the news is not what I'd seen with my own eyes, and I felt Palestinian parents also preferred their children playing safely in their backyards. The missiles exploded just near enough to blow apart my world as I knew it, forever changing me. And you'd never recognize my life today with what it was like then. I believe I found my life's purpose. Hello, my name is Penny St, and I'm the host of Peace with Penny. I'm excited to say that we are celebrating three years of having the honor to speak with Israelis and Palestinians who work on peace together on our podcast, Peace with Penny. Folks willing to set aside their valid grievances, some who've even lost children to the conflict and realize retaliation can't bring their loved ones back, yet they move forward working with one another to try and make their neighborhoods safe to live in. Even during war, when emotions are high, we know Israelis and Palestinians want peace. Peace is the only means to an acceptable future that makes sense. The only solution that can bring the violence to an end. The organizations we interview work hard every day to move closer to achieving peace at the grassroots level. I've worked in peace a decade. I recently heard of the term post-traumatic growth. That process of going through a traumatic situation and it changing your life positively. I think PTG describes what happened to me. Now imagine being two warring peoples where both sides have grown up, where everyone has post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD from the time they're innocent children living in a battle zone. Yet many of the people around them try to bury that fact in their daily existence, downplaying reality that they must have bomb shelters built in their homes or not waiting for the recommended 10 minutes in the bomb shelter after Iron Dome destroys the missiles so they don't get bonked in the head with falling shrapnel from the sky. I've seen businessmen walk out of the bomb shelter after a couple minutes, but they have places to go and people to see. Trust me, I waited 10 minutes plus, just in case. I couldn't help but wonder what reality did the men live in, ignoring the warnings. Perhaps they've convinced themselves that nothing can happen to them. And I wonder what else they have ignored to the risk of their own safety and perhaps others. Are their brains trying to protect them psychologically, convincing them not to worry so they don't deal with the realization that their lives are always in danger? What other less than optimal solutions do they follow without realizing the ineffective consequences of their actions. And the Palestinians don't even have bomb shelters to hide in. In Gaza, Hamas has built miles of tunnels, underground hospitals, schools, and mosques, not to save civilians, but to use to transit and shoot their missiles, store weapons, protect themselves, and hide hostages. Meanwhile, above ground, they use their people callously as human shields. 
The death toll in the Israel-Hamas war is staggering and unrelenting. These are not numbers, these are humans. One is too many children whose lives have been horrifically cut short or uprooted searching for safety. Our parents didn't let us pummel our siblings when we disagreed. Why are nations allowed to? When hate is reinforced, the story will end miserably. Anyway, we're glad that you decided to join us for our celebration and to recap just a few of the peace organizations we've had the privilege to interview this past year. The greatest disservice that media has done is by only showing the horrific scenes of death and destruction, which has convinced the entire world there never will be peace in the Middle East. At Peace with Penny, we're happy to share with you the more than 100 interviews we've accumulated in our library, positive stories of peace organizations for the most part made up of Israelis and Palestinians working together on peace as a team. These pockets of peace are hopeful. Peace with Penny is the platform to bring them into your homes, and we thank you for listening. These NGOs approach peace from many different angles medicine, the environment, music, art, communication, education, academia, women's rights, sports, language, health and interfaith dialogue, even using cartoons, sometimes concentrating on specific communities and for all ages, adults or kids with education in schools and in summer camps, trying to reach everyone, including the younger generation who will be tasked with trying to solve this mess. 2023 was an exciting year. Our interview library is filled with peace organizations we've spoken with, and each week we speak with more. Personally, I was asked to be in the Marquis Who's Who biographies, and they also chose me as a woman of influence in their professional women's edition. I also was just asked to write for the Times of Israel, so 2024 is starting out with new opportunities. However, we can't ignore the Israel-Hamas war. Tomorrow it will be four months old, and there's no end in sight. It is a strange time to be talking about peace, you might think. We wondered what we should do, too. How to continue a peace podcast when the parties are at war with each other? The peace organizations gave us the answer. They said it's more important now than ever for people to know that Israelis and Palestinians can live together in peace, regardless of what their leaders are pushing. The politicians don't seem to feel the obligation to put the safety of their people as the top priority. We would have preferred to only talk about the terrific work of these peacemakers, but felt that wouldn't be an honest representation of this past year and since October 7th and the Israel-Hamas war. So we will begin the broadcast in honor of those innocents slaughtered then and since. No one can believe the extent of the horrific atrocities committed on October 7th and that the terrorists are proud, filmed, and celebrated their heinous, inhumane acts. Forgive us for the disturbing summary of some of the disgusting events, but it's necessary to combat those calling this merely resistance or denying its occurrence. Girls and women were repeatedly raped, some killed while being raped, and the rapist continued his evil ecstasy even after the girls took their last breath. Nails pounded into or bullets shot into their genitals, breasts cut off and thrown around to other comrades as playful toys, wives raped in front of their husbands and afterwards killing the husband. There's more, but I will stop the listing of just some of the atrocities. You get the picture. Killing is horrible, but this was evil. 136 hostages are still being held. The effort to nullify that these events even occurred. The silence and lack of empathy by some organizations supposedly created to defend these types of events, seeming to indicate that if you're a Jewish woman, we won't defend you. How does the world allow this to be acceptable? Heartbreakingly, it's not the first time. The UN and their predictably biased lack of support for Israel, but readiness to condemn. UNRWA found was a dozen employees participating in the October 7th atrocities. The continued surge of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia increased since the war began, which had already heightened. The Secure Community Network reported a 112% increase in 2023 of anti-Semitism, marking the highest surge in such incidents 
with an overwhelming 5,404 incidents recorded. Unfortunately, I could only find information that Islamophobia had increased, no statistics for the year. However, it is a small fraction of the number of anti-Semitic incidents. The reward for our kids working so hard to get into universities was their administrations ignoring their fear and refusing to protect them complicit with harm to students. As parents, it's hard enough to send our young adults free to fly and make their own paths. But before, we at the very least thought they would be safe. If we were Israelis sending their kids off to the mandatory military, fear and reluctance would be expected. But college? The horrific scenes of human shields killed while Israel seeks to eliminate Hamas and stop the butchery and the continued threat that there will be more. Missiles, car bombing, shootings, knifings, car rammings, and incendiary devices. Israelis have consistently been attacked for years. But what parent can stomach watching the thousands of grieving parents holding their dead children? Verified numbers of dead and injured are horrific, and few look beyond the numbers. The use of methods to eliminate Hamas that, due to Hamas's use of human shields, was predictably going to create a backlash that Israel will never heal from. Israeli leaders believing they are right and ignoring the international outrage proceeded anyway, led to international accusations of genocide and the complete failure of the Israeli government, who had a year's worth of foreknowledge to act. Some claim the, the young female soldiers warning their military superiors weren't listened to because they were women reporting the warnings. When will humans get past misogyny? The horrific crisis time is calculable. This alone shattered Israel's long-held beliefs that their beloved Israel would protect them, even if others won't. Never again rings in their ears, but conjures up not protection, but abandonment. Take a deep breath. I know these are awful events this past year, and even as we speak. A song I love is by Michael Hunter Oaks called A Healing Song, Refua Shlema. Refua Shlema is the Hebrew version of Get Well Soon. I often send it to people when they need to heal. I find comfort in music. Do you? I think all the world could use a listen. And so I asked Michael if I could have permission to play it for you. He graciously consented. I've decided to share it at the close of our celebration today for everyone who needs healing during these harsh times. From my perspective... I'd say the whole world needs comforting. And next, let's turn to our wonderful peace organizations we've spoken with during our third year that brought us joy and let the world know that most Israelis and Palestinians do want peace, but they don't make the news. We'll speak with the peace organizations about their impactful work, what they experienced on or just after October 7th, and what they are able to do now given the war is going on four months old. We are going to start with an organization that is a success story of peace called The Path of Hope and Peace. We'll be speaking with Phil Saunders. We first spoke with Phil in January of 2022, and we wanted to get an update of their work in September 2023 with some additional feedback from October 7th, conditions afterwards, and currently. Path of Hope and Peace began in 2014 as a connection between peacemakers in the Israeli town of Sur Hadassah in the Palestinian town of Hussan. In Israel and the West Bank, communities are often divided along ethnic and religious lines. We'll learn how Path of Hope and Peace has transformed the town of Hussan from a center of violence into a model of peace and cooperation. Since the beginning, they've added other Palestinian and Israeli towns and have become a model embraced as a working prototype for conflict transformation, which today is known as the Hussan, Beitar Elite, and Sir Hadassah model. In 2021, Path of Hope and Peace was awarded the Victor J. Goldberg Prize for Peace in the Middle East. What we think will be terrific for you to learn about is how they've turned a town like Hussan at one time known for promoting terrorist attacks against Israelis into a town of peace and how these Palestinian and Israeli towns work together for economic benefits. And when attacks occur, they're able to maintain the peace. They have worked so hard to achieve. So let's begin. Welcome, Phil. You Penny. It's great to be back. Yeah, great to have you back. So first, I wanted to play two short clips to show what can happen even in more violent times, like in May 2021, 
during another time of expanded violence. And then we'll look at how it looks today, even with all the violence happening this year. Hello, everyone. Here we are at the entrance to the town of Khusan, a Palestinian town in the West Bank. And as we walk in, we can see that there's a red sign that warns Israelis that entrance to this Palestinian village could be dangerous for Israeli citizens. But the reality is that sign is out of date because a change has happened in this town. Over the course of years, from having been dangerous for Israelis in the intifadas, this is now a town where the signs are written in Hebrew. This is Puncturia, where you get your uh, car punctures uh, fixed. And if we look, we see Hebrew on almost all of the signs here because their livelihoods depend upon Israelis coming in and buying things. And now, if we look at these signs over here, the sign in black, white and yellow there, that says Shtipat Hashalom. That's the car wash of peace. And underneath it, in white, this is written Kiosk Hashalom. It's the kiosk of peace, where Israelis can come and buy everything cheaply, whatever they might need. And this is, this is how we have it in Khusan now for many years. And we've built a robust coexistence that can even stand difficult periods such as what we've just gone through, where fires were burning all over the land. Here we were working together as a team to keep the peace and the coexistence going. And that's what we're seeing today, here at the end of May 2021. And by keeping the peace, we were able to get straight back to normality after the war. This was the first group to come and visit us already at the end of May. A mixed group of Jewish and Arab Israelis that came to visit the beautiful natural springs in the town of Hussan. And this is just the latest in many trips that we've been having to the town of Hussan in recent months. Yachad is the Hebrew word for together and in our neighborhood Israelis and Palestinians work together to build coexistence both at difficult times when we need to stand together in solidarity and at happier times when we can work together and learn new skills together and build peace for the benefit of generations to come. Now we'll play much more recent video just so you can see that even after this last, oh, what's it been about a year and a half of ugliness, far too much violence. 18th of September 2023, and I'm back at the entrance of the Signs written in Hebrew, and walking into the town. This is written on the army post. It's long, but it's written there. Yeah. We'll do. Shalom. Shalom. This is the entrance of the entrance with our friends. And uh, this is where Israelis come. And uh, everything is doing in our area because we maintain things. Lots and lots of yellow number plates coming in, Israeli number plates, um, but also lots of white number plates, Palestinians. That's what coexistence looks like. We had pre recorded our interview toward the end of September, which was slated for broadcast October 10th. But then, shortly after, the barbarous terror attacks were executed on October 7th. We spoke to Phil on October 10th and asked him how he, his wife, and teenage daughter are doing as they spend their time in their bomb shelter safe room. And I also asked him what he wanted to do about the interview. Here's what Phil said. Hi, Penny. We're now three days into this horror, and it's just getting worse and worse and all the indications are that we're still just at the beginning. 
And from a personal point of view, I can honestly say that these three days have been the most shocking and distressing and frightening three days of my entire 18 years of living here. Day one, we were blasted from complacency. I woke at seven in the morning to the sound of thuds in the distance, followed by rocket sirens that began in our area at 8.15, and we scuttled down to our reinforced room, me, my wife and teenage daughter, and ended up spending the whole morning there because there were so many rocket sirens, more that morning than I had heard in my entire 18 years up till that point. And while sheltering there, I was exchanging lots of messages with my peacemaker partners, including Palestinian friends living in the neighbouring villages who'd had rockets fall in their villages and we were all expressing solidarity and mutual support because we very much felt that we were in this together and by comparison day two was eerily calm and I decided to leave the house for the first time and went around to Adassa, my town, and into Ziad's town, Kusan, and everything was eerily quiet. It was like the eye of the storm, and that was the day that the full truth descended upon us, that what had happened the previous day was Israel's 9-11, where Hamas flooded into Israeli communities killing and kidnapping at will with apparently Israeli security forces nowhere in sight for hours. And as the second day proceeded, the death toll just rose and rose from double figures into triple figures and was approaching a thousand by the end of the day, leaving us reeling in shock and horror and fear of what might be to come. And then on day three, Israel's response began in full force and now the Palestinian death toll is also rising and rising and we are all suffering terribly and I had to think whether it was appropriate to release our interview at such a horrifically dark time. But then I thought maybe its message is needed now more than ever because we have to show that there is another way that instead of fighting each other, we can live together and that's what we've been doing now for many years in this part of the land and we are standing strong together because we are not willing to let violence and extremism drive a wedge between Israelis and Palestinians in this neighborhood. And so I believe our interview can be a vital message of hope at this terrible time. Phil also showed us how the situation hadn't changed, thankfully, a couple of weeks after October 7th, and it was still quiet in Hussan on October 21st. 21st of October, 2023, and everything's still quiet here at the entrance of Hussan. Tim Rotsim, like him, Marshall, you want to say something, Mark? Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Finally, Phil showed us on January 24th, 2024, how it was still calm. 24th of January, 2024, in the entrance of Kusan. <laughs> Very rainy day, but uh, the rain stopped now for a bit. And here we are, things are quiet. <laughs> This has been a very long war, and we have no idea when it's going to finish. But here, we're still keeping the peace. Marshal Kaziad. Okay, Makawe. Hi, Penny. This is Phil. This is your update on the situation at the end of January 2024 in our zone of coexistence. It has been an extremely long war, still with no end in sight, and we've all had to do a lot of adjusting to the reality. One of the first things the army did at the start of the war was to close the gate at the entrance of Hussan to block, block off entrance for Israelis to the towns of Hussan and Nakhalin and Batir on the other side of that gate. But there is one small Palestinian village named Wadi Fukin, which ended up on the Israeli side. And they normally do their, shop, their shopping in uh, Hussan as well. So ever since then, 
we've had a situation where instead of doing our shopping in Cycle Sun, we all come up to the gate of Kusan and purchase things at the gate uh, under the watchful eyes of the soldiers there. And the soldiers keep changing. Every 45 days you get a new complement of soldiers and every time I need to speak to them and explain to them that they are not in Gaza or some other hostile place and that we have coexistence here and we want to keep it that way. And most of the soldiers are receptive to that, but not all. And uh, there was one case very early on the 15th of October when I got a call from my friends at the entrance of Khusan and they said that there's a soldier who's been threatening them. Um, so I went there uh, and they told me which one he was and I spoke to him. And I said, listen, you know, we're, we're trying to keep the peace here and that's what you want to do as well. So let's work together. And he said, well, that's not why I'm here, though. And I said, so why are you here? He said, I'm here for victory. And I said, well, if you want victory, go to Gaza. There's a war there, but there isn't a war here and we don't want anyone bringing it. And uh, I then raised my voice and asked who's in charge here because there were three soldiers there, and one of them said, I am. And I spoke to him, and I told him what uh, that soldier had said to me, and that we don't need a soldier with that kind of mentality uh, in our area. And half an hour later, uh, a jeep came and took that soldier away, and we never saw him again. Thanks so much, Phil, for the update on what's happened since our last interview with you on October 10th. Path of Hope and Peace is truly a light in our lives, and your work is very much appreciated and is a glowing accomplishment that we hope will be duplicated throughout the region. Next, we'll hear about a terrific institution of scientists called the Malta Conference Foundation. The Malta Conference Foundation just completed their 10th symposium of scientists and Nobel laureates aptly named Frontiers of Science, Innovation, Research, and Education in the Middle East, A Bridge to Peace. We spoke with their president, Zafra Lerman, to learn about their science diplomacy. The Malta Conferences Foundation is the only platform in the world which brings together scientists from 15 Middle East countries, Bahrain, Egypt, Iraq, Iran, Israel, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Oman, Palestine, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Turkey and the United Arab Emirates with Nobel laureates to work for five days on solving regional problems, establishing cross-border collaborations and forging relationships that bridge chasms of distrust and intolerance. Zafra Lerman is a scientist, educator and humanitarian. She has over 40 distinguished international awards and was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for the fifth time. She holds a PhD in chemistry from the Weizmann Institute of Science and conducted research on isotope effects at Cornell and Northwestern Universities in the U.S. and the ETH, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland. Ms. Lerman also developed an innovative approach of teaching science at all levels using art, music, dance, drama, rap, and cultural backgrounds. Needless to say, she's a very accomplished and interesting person. Now, before we meet Zafra, I wanted to show you a clip with an overview of how the Malta Conference Foundation works through science to move toward peace in the Middle East. Imagine walking into a room and seeing scientists from Syria, Iraq, Iran, Gaza, Israel, Palestine, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Egypt, and Jordan sitting at a table discussing potential scientific collaborations with civility and friendship. Imagine a bit later in the evening seeing those scientists dancing together. You might be wondering, is this actually real? Yes, it is. And it happens every two years on the island of Malta at the Malta Conferences. The Malta Conferences, brainchild of noted chemist Dr. Safra Lerman, gathers scientists, entrepreneurs, postdocs, and students from 15 Middle East countries, plus Morocco and Pakistan. 
The participants engage in talks and workshops with Nobel laureates and network with other distinguished scientists to identify unique opportunities for collaboration to meet the scientific and technological challenges of the region. More than 700 Middle Eastern scientists and 16 Nobel laureates have attended the Malta conferences since the first conference in 2003. Each conference lasts for five days and deals with issues of science education, air and water quality, medicinal chemistry, biotechnology, nanoscience, nuclear and chemical security and alternative energy sources, among other topics of mutual interest. Science diplomacy is a vital mechanism for working towards peace and stability in the Middle East. Improving regional scientific cooperation aids sustainable economic development and promotes peace and political reconciliation. People-to-people -people contact and mutual understanding can lead to lasting friendships and collaborations that transcend political and cultural differences. Scientists can do what lawyers, diplomats, soldiers and presidents haven't yet been able to do. Chemistry provides hope for peace and understanding in one of the most troubled regions of the world. The Malta Conferences. Science as a bridge to peace. Welcome, Zafra. So do you have a favorite description of the Malta Conference? Uh, what the Malta Conference is uh, doing is using science diplomacy as a bridge to peace in the Middle East by bringing together under the same roof for five days scientists from all the Middle East countries, all of them, and now Morocco and Pakistan are there for by their request. They are not Middle Eastern countries. They are they, Morocco is an Arab Muslim country. Pakistan is a Muslim country, and they asked to participate. And we bring few Nobel laureates, and the idea is to develop collaboration and friendship that can overcome the chasms of distrust and intolerance. Uh, everybody stays in the same place, in the same five-star hotel. Everybody, the Nobel laureate and the graduate students are eating all the meals together. Social events are all together. The people are not separated only for sleeping from each other. So the interaction is going on all the time. And we have plenary lectures by Nobel laureates, and then we have interactive uh, workshops that are on important issues to the region and the world. Like in the last Malta conference, we had water, energy, food security nexus, we had medicinal chemistry, we had nanotechnology, uh, we had science education at all levels, and we had a very important workshop on biological, chemical, and nuclear uh, safety, uh, trying to get rid of all this weapon of mass destruction. We form collaboration because there are a lot of issues that no, no country alone in the region can solve, like uh, air pollution. If one country will clean their air, one wind will bring the pollution for another. The countries are very close to each other. The water, the aqueduct goes along borders because nature and the environment don't know the borders that the British or uh, who knows who put there. So we see the planet as borderless. And uh, therefore you need collaboration to make sure that everybody has clean water to drink and energy to use. And this must be in collaboration between several countries. The friendship after, if you would see what happened at the end, the tears that people cry to say goodbyes, the hugging is just unbelievable. But now after the horrific Hamas torture that occurred on October 7th, how do we continue? 
as the shocking stories of what the Israelis endured becoming public and seeing how Hamas continues to use their people as human shields resulting in horrific losses, how to proceed promoting peace becomes the question to answer. Some of the peace organizations we spoke with say it's more important now than ever. Some say they must pause. The first peace activists I ever met after our fateful trip in 2014 were Rabbi Hanan Schlesinger, an Orthodox settler who lives in Judea and Samaria, or what's also known as the West Bank, and Ali Abu Awad, a Palestinian from the respected Awad family who helped found Ruth Shorashim Judah. In fact, their story is in my book. Roots is a unique binational initiative with a network of Israeli residents of the Gush Etzion area, otherwise known as religious settlers and Palestinians from neighboring towns and villages who have come to see each other as the partners who both need to make changes to end their conflict. Roots' mission is to enhance dialogue, transformation, and bridge building, and it is based on a mutual recognition of each people's connection to the land. Roots is about developing understanding and solidarity despite ideological differences. Roots is a place where local peoples can take responsibility. Their work is aimed at challenging the assumptions their communities hold about each other, building trust and creating a new discourse around the conflict in their respective societies. This is a grassroots and local model for making change from the bottom up. When this war started, I was just preparing to speak to another member of Roots, Dr. Gideon Alazar, who is an acclaimed researcher at the Eastern Authority of Research and Development, Ariel University, and a lecturer at Bar Ilan University. His research deals with the anthropology of religion, religious identity, and space construction in contemporary China and Israel Palestine. So, of course, I felt it was necessary to ask how he is doing. The interview that follows is of our discussion, beginning with what does Ruth Shorashim Judah think they should do when Israel is at war? Some people that I talk to say it's more important now than ever. Mm -hmm. Others say we have to pause. I think I heard that you said that you had to pause. But what do you think? What are you able to do under these circumstances? I mean, it's a question that I've been thinking about a lot in the past, uh, you know, week and a half. I felt that I personally had to pause just on the on on the level of, you know, feeling that this time is a time of shock and a time of mourning. And you know, frankly, I think like most everybody I know around here haven't really been able to do anything. I feel, you know, I, could I clarify uh, your meaning? Not about peace. You're meaning just you're in shock. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm meaning uh, I'll get to peace in a minute, but but just in general, yeah. you know, this is just a time in which it's very hard. The focus is so. I mean, the the, the events, the the massacre uh, that took place, and the the atrocities are so. Uh, it's such a shock. Uh, we've never really had anything close to this uh, event. So we're all, I feel we're all uh, kind of walking around in a, in a haze. Yeah. So in that uh, sense, I feel, I, you know, I feel, that I feel like that people. too. And yeah. I'm a law very far away, but I have so many friends and colleagues that have been impacted by this. What we do is talk with people who have gone beyond their own narratives and realize that peace is the only way. And it's absolutely beautiful. But when a war starts and in such a, I mean, war is ugly under any circumstances, but the heinous crimes that were committed were are overwhelming to understand uh, when you're talking about babies beheaded and riddled with bullets and the rapes and the hostages. And yeah, I mean, that. you can't even really talk about it because it's too gross. It's just too right. and it's, much. It's too sensitive. And I feel, you know, even, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just a very, very difficult situation. Even, even talking to Palestinians, I mean, we've had, I think our close Palestinian friends and roots have been empathetic and have been have condemned the atrocities. And I think are also shocked 
at the extent. So that's reaffirming in a sense. But they're also worried clearly about Gaza. And I you know, I don't know if you saw that Abu Mazen, the head of the PA, uh, after many days of waiting, yeah. wrote a condemnation and then erased it. And I think that that's kind of indicative of where a lot of Palestinians are, kind of hesitant as where where to put themselves. And obviously it makes uh, dialogue difficult. And what actually happened in your locale? We are quite far from the Gaza border. So in Israeli terms, we're about a minute and a half. We have a minute and a half warning. There's a sign Siren, which is a lot, a minute and a half. Uh, and we're wow. also not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It must be the young or something. <laughs> I mean, that does not sound so safe. Yeah, pe people who live in the vicinity of Gaza usually have, you know, sometimes 10 seconds well, or less. true. So on the morning of Simchat Torah on the 7th, I um, I heard explosions in the morning and they were explosions that were from missiles uh, fired and in the direction of Jerusalem. So I could hear those and I I, I felt I knew that something, something was wrong. Did but you then, have any sirens at that point? We didn't have any sirens, no, because we're kind of out of the way is you could work towards the east. So we didn't have any sirens, but rumors started appearing about what was going on. And slowly, you know, I was in synagogue all day, but, you know, slowly people started disappearing and going. People were starting to get drafted. So people started putting on their uniforms and, and leaving leaving synagogue and driving away. So only in the evening did I understand the magnitude of what had happened. But, it, you know, it was clear that something was going on and people were both religious and secular people in uh, Tukha. Oh, so uh -huh. people were with their phones on and, and right. tuned to the news. So did, way, did you, know, you know more of the atrocities that were happening or did you not find out till that night? Only really found out until the, until the night. As I, heard, I said, we had heard that there was severe infiltration. We had, we heard that, you know, that, that people were, that some people were killed. I opened my phone on Saturday night and the, the headline was that a hundred people had been killed. I was shocked you know, that it could be so many. We've now moved, it's 13 fold that, right? We've now moved yeah. past the 1300 mark. Just so inconceivable, just un, un, just unbelievable so many ways, not to mention the way they were killed. I will say one thing about, you know, living in the in the territories, you know, in the West Bank, we, we're not affected directly from Gaza, but everything here is on very high alert and we've moved you know the the arm we've moved to much more protection and and you know there's a lot of fear here that similar that something similar could happen i have uh, to tell you believe it or not that there's a bit of that feeling here as well with all the anti-semitism they had already kicked up we already had guards at temple and then we had the sheriff and now it's even more so because of the call for jihad so there's a bit of that feeling even all the way over here 7500 miles away that uh, both the Jewish communities and the Muslim communities need to be protected as well interesting I, I didn't realize that well I'm not surprised I feel you know the vibe is is everywhere with this, uh, you know, event that's that's so big, and you know, and who knows? We maybe hope not, but of course, but we may be looking towards a, a regional war. It's it's unclear uh, what you know how how this thing can escalate, but at least here, you know, in Tikka, we're surrounded by Arab villages. Right. And of course, there's the fear that things could get out of hand here as, as well, which is really unfortunate because, you know, our feeling here was, I won't say it was friendly, but it seemed reasonable. Your relationships with Palestinians who believe in roots, I'm assuming you have talked to them. Right. And what what are they telling you in terms of what they believe at this point? Or is, is there any confusion in terms of working together, not wanting to work together, feeling more frightened if they do because of the anti-normalization? What are they inclined to want to continue working on peace? Do they Are they saying they feel like born two different ways or more? What kind of vibes are you getting from them? Roots will continue. We've been through many crises and I think that they believe in, in the dialogue. I'm not worried about that. But I mean, you've had, you through the years, you must have had hundreds, if not thousands of people who have gone through the various programs that you have. That's true. And uh, we've had many, many people going through the programs. Programs. And I think it's just it's just too early to say Israelis are in shock. And I think the Palestinians are in shock, too. I think that they did not see 
anything of this magnitude coming. So uh, the Israeli sides, obviously the founders who, of course, would be more gung-ho. Are you from your neighbors and so on? It seems at least here that they're presenting Israel as being one voice and people with differing opinions don't have a differing opinion of this. That Israel is never one voice, really. I mean, I yeah, that's yeah that's but one. I'm just saying that's how it's presented, whether or not that's true is is yeah. one voice for a little bit yeah so you, know, you know but that will quickly sure change. Of course. and and e even now i can see that there are different approaches but yeah as i said i think that this i, I think i said you know, i think we have to we have to face the fact that this what happened is a I mean, serious setback and for yeah. israelis it will be difficult it will be difficult again i think the 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 the, the core issue is the extent of the atrocities. Feeling that people could do such things, I think it, it would be difficult to convince Israelis here, but who are not parts of part of roots, people who are who are not, right. you know, or who were peripheral in roots. Right. Uh, I think it will be difficult, uh, at least while the war is happening and for the next while. Saying this with pain. When we are in such pain and mourning, it's very hard to see the other side. Did uh, you know people? Uh... You know, p friends of friends. Uh -huh. Several, several friends of friends. Israel is a small country and we're all, you know, interconnected. I think, you know, we have to, I'll say, I, I think we have to realize that this is a huge blow to the idea of peace in this region. I don't think it's a death blow, and I'll get to that in a minute. I, I think, I still believe that at the end of the day, both peoples are going to be here and we're going to have to try and make it. But to be f honest with ourselves, <laughs> our ability in the near future to get people on board in Israel to the idea of living together is, I feel, is severely damaged. And we have to, that's just a fact that we're going to have to reckon with. I think that you know, the future of peace very much depends on where this conflict will end and how this conflict will end. We're only at the beginning, really, yeah. or so it would seem. How things will fan out at the end is crucial to see. But yeah, I, I mean, I feel that, that that's just a reality. On the other side, you know, I think that the basic situation of th this region is that there are two peoples here, and that's not going to change. However, whenever we will have to, we will have to find a way. You know, I feel that a lot of people, fortunately, deluding themselves that somehow we'll, you know, we'll have some kind of apocalyptic. This is the apocalypse that we, that some people have all been waiting for, but you know, that the. the yeah, example, I hear that a lot from Palestinian side. I have not heard that yet from the Israeli side. However, obviously, listening to the comments that Netanyahu makes and other folks like that in the government, it doesn't sound good. Yeah, I think, I mean, what I'm referring to is mostly, you know, on the right and the Israeli right, there's, I think, the, what I believe is a fantasy, but who knows, really, that, you know, the idea that Gaza somehow be emptied or mostly emptied people and that, you know, Israel will be able to take control uh, of the Strip in a permanent sense. I don't think that that's going to happen. But, you know, I think a lot of that is, again, just the trauma and the grief speaking. And there's there's just so much anger. The cost of that, and not that I think Netanyahu cares, but the cost of that in human civilian lives, it matters regardless of what he thinks. But it, in a framework of the international community, and maybe he doesn't care about that either. No, he cares a lot. He cares but, a lot. I have to say, Netanyahu, I don't think, I think it's a mistake to see Netanyahu as the extreme element here. Netanyahu is actually Mr. Appeasement. He, it, Netanyahu is an interesting character because he is a person who talks a very tough talk. But in fact, the whole idea of maintaining the Hamas and propping it up and, and having it exist for so many years is really that's Netanyahu's making. He's responsible. For, in uh, what for, regard? Uh, Israel could have toppled the Hamas regime several times in the past 15 or 20 years, which it would have been since 2005. It was Netanyahu's conscious decision not to topple the Hamas, and to and he, it was his decision to, to maintain Hamas rule there. Every, because... every round of violence we've had, they've stopped short of, of toppling Hamas regime because it was comfortable for him not to not to go all the way with it, to allow Gaza to, to, ex to exist and to just kind of manage the conflict. That's always been his, his, uh, his approach. So he talks tough about Hamas, but in fact, in many ways, he's responsible 
for the fact that Hamas continued to to grow and get powerful and became, uh, you know, this uh, what is basically an Iranian an Iranian base five minutes from Ashkelon. So I, I, I'm worried, actually, that Netanyahu is not, isn't really made of the material of making a, a, a decisive action against the Hamas. Because uh, I think that at this point, it's clear to most people here, at least I would say most people here believe that the Hamas regime has to be dismantled. There's no other way. We have to, we have, we cannot allow you know, a regime like that to continue to exist. Could, um, could you explain to... that more? I want to be sure that people don't have to assume what you mean as opposed to you saying exactly what you mean. What I mean, I'll say exactly what I mean. What I mean is that at this point of the conflict, the only solution we have that will provide security for our children is to enter the Gaza Strip, dismantle the, the Hamas apparatus, occupy the Strip, dismantle the Hamas apparatus, and then gradually and in some supervised process, return Gaza to the Gazans, either to the PA or to the P or the, to the to, or to some kind of international force or something mm-hmm. like that. But the first phase, I don't know how that's going to happen. But the yeah. first phase, I feel there's really that we have no choice. We have a murderous Iranian-backed regime at our doorstep that has already taken this huge toll. The action has to be to uh, dismantle it, to take to take hold, to take responsibility of the Gaza Strip again temporarily. I'm not talking about annexation. I'm not talking about rebuilding the Israeli settlements. That doesn't interest me. I'm talking about uh, our responsibility to our children, which is for this place to be a safe place to live in. You know, I think without doing that, nobody will return to live in the vicinity of Gaza. Israel is a small country, as I'm sure you know. That's that's a lot of people. Yeah. It's, it's become un- unlivable. And not to mention the the fact that our other enemies are observing, are carefully observing our response. And unfortunately, and this is something that maybe is not common to hear, uh, you know, I think it's it's not enough said in the peace circle. Being weak in this neighborhood is is a danger. And it's in fact, it's irresponsible. We cannot allow ourselves to appear weak. Defining weak, do you mean if you don't go after this situation in a violent manner? Yes. If we do not solve the problem once and for all, problem we've been suffering for for, for so many years, yeah. uh, or make a, you know an exerted military effort to, to stop the problem, that we, uh, yes, that will be that will be perceived as weakness uh, and which will be taken advantage of, I have no doubt. As you know, Hezbollah is already testing yeah. the ground against us and seeing, you know, is Israel decisive or not? We'll get back to the grief thing in a minute, but, you know, I'm telling you, when, I, when I'm talking about this issue of, of you taking control of, of the Gaza Strip, again, I want to emphasize, I'm not talking about this as, as a means, as a way to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Simply a need for, for you know, for security, emergency need to take control of the situation, after which we'll have to get back to the peace. Uh, we will have to find our way back to the peace. Uh, you know, and I, I had a meeting with our, our friends from the Federal Forum this past week, mm-hmm. and we had an interesting disagreement, you know, and I don't even know what side I'm on. You know, some people said, you know, this is an opportunity. Uh, and actually, at the end of the day, because the two-state solution seems dead, we will have to find a way to live federally. Uh, others said, no, no, we can't speak of this as an opportunity. Uh, it's only a setback. I really don't know. It, I, I think it's too soon to say. I know well what you're talking about as far as the federal forum and their intentions of having instead of a two-state solution, but to be either a federation or confederation more like United States. But can you just briefly explain that? Movement that was started uh, two years ago, we started meeting. It's actually a union of many small organizations Mm -hmm. that have already, that were dealing with different... I think there are about seven different proposals something like that and there may be more yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and they you know there's i like to think of federation confederation as kind of a spectrum so right. it, so there are people different organizations uh, located different on different points of that spectrum uh but we all have in common the idea that any solution has to really be a combination of shared rule and self-rule so whether it's to 
uh, what they call sometimes a three-state solution, two states, and then and then an overall several state right. or a canton system like they have in Switzerland, yes. different or different options like that. Uh, but they all they're all based on the principle which I still truly believe that the division of the land to, into two completely sovereign states is not an option anymore. And so we have to find a way of sharing this space in different ways, allowing for self-rule to some extent and, and for some elements of shared rule. But that's the only solution that will work at the end. Yeah, I think it's, it's really important to point out, however, because I know it's referred to sometimes by people who don't understand as a one-state solution and they're implying that Israel just takes over everything which is not the case so no no not at all not at all so but but if people aren't familiar with it and they if they hear instead of two they want one that's how it goes in their mind mm. so uh, I think it's really important what you're saying of how they all have this kind of overarching situations like say the federal government of the u.s and that would right. be more right. in charge of security and things like that however each whether they call it cantons or 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 regions or whatever they call it would have uh, similar to the states here where they would have their own individual emphasis. So in other words, the Palestinians, say you're Palestinians living in X district, you would enjoy the overarching, say, security of all of whatever this ultimately is called, plus your regional government. And so the Palestinians can do their own thing in say area q r and s and and that the israelis right. would have tuv there could be, there could be many combinations yeah. you know yeah. and i think i think you know for my, for us the most important thing is the, the shift the paradigm shift right from separation and division some kinds of working together but I have to say, and I'll, I'll say two things about that. One is that I think one of our mistakes, the Gaza is something separate from this solution. You know, I think right. some, of the, some of the members of the forum felt that Gaza has kind of gone its own way. And there, and of course, that's an illusion. There's, there's going to be no solution without Gaza. We have to find a way uh, to include Gaza in any solution. Right. But say even speaking about these issues, I feel that they have to recognize that these things are not around the corner especially considering where we are right now. We only had a taste for a couple of weeks of what this has been like for years and years for Israelis running to bomb shelters. And and now, of course, this has taken on an even more unimaginable violent situation with what happened about a week and a half ago. But Gideon, can you describe what Root Shorashim Judah is to you? Um, yes, Roots, I mean, I would say that at this point, jump to the end, Roots is 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 a community for me. It has become a community, uh, a community of people, local people. It's a very grassroots organization living in the in the region between Jerusalem and Hebron, so in Judea, both Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, and I feel that, you know, we've, we've in the past 10 years, we've been through many trials. We have stuck together. It's a community of faith, faith in, in, a, in a common future together in the land, faith in being able to live and respect each other. Every year, Hadassah Fruman, who is the wife, the widow of our late teacher and, and the visionary of Roots, he, he wasn't, he hasn't, he was not uh, fortunate enough to to see the foundation of the movement, but he is our, uh, I would say, spiritual father, uh, right. Rabbi Nachem Roman. Every year, Hadassah has in her sukkah Palestinian and Israeli friends from from Roots. And this year, I have to say, it was a particularly lovely meeting. And we sat around speaking about our connection to the different uh, patriarchs, to Abraham, and we spoke about uh, Joseph and we spoke about you know the different uh, our you know our shared prophet and they told us stories from the Quran and we shared some stories from the Torah and it was just a very it just felt uh, you know being at home leaving in, in the vision and in in the in the perseverance uh, staying together my kids have been to the summer camp they have we have a joint Israeli Palestinian summer camp several times. 
And I feel it's, it's also important for me in this ambiance of city to expose my children as much as possible to Palestinian friends. What day was the, did you have the the night at the Sukkah? Just a few days before the 7th. Saturday. For the last, what, year and a half, it's been an uptick in violence. And you've had rockets, you've had stabbings and shootings. And how does this compare with that off the board i mean it's nothing to it, it has it's not I, I think you know there's another issue we have to keep in mind for a lot of israelis what happened this last shabbat on the 7th is not just about the violence of the palestinian it's about the lack of reaction of the state and the it felt like there was no state at all you know it felt people were in there were were uh, stuck uh for hours and the army was not responding so what this, is what is their reasoning or they are not saying yet or they're saying they're putting it off we'll analyze it later we have things to I do think, now. You know, in, 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 in a nutshell what happened was is what always happens in these the over reliance on technological means what happens is that you get complacent the enemy learns how to move around them uh they were very they planned well the hamas and they were able to to take out cameras and other observation means and basically create a situation in which nobody was running the show. Nobody was, the military was was incapacitated, the, the leadership of the military. I can't so, help but think that from the Israelis I've seen and from what I've, you know, the leaders, how much do you think their arrogance of, we know so much, we're so powerful, they wouldn't dare. We've got it covered. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that, the, I think that systems become arrogant. They become entrenched with this kind of, you know, uh, and yes, of course, there's that as well, you know. There, and, and, I think but, it's, there's I, also I, PTSD. I think the whole nation suffers from PTSD. For sure. For sure. And yeah, that I mean, with that, there has to be some part that, because the, you know, these atrocities are not, this type of atrocity might be new, but atrocities, I would call missiles firing into Israel all the time, stabbings and uh, terrorists blowing themselves up and car rammings and all the other things. Those are atrocities as well. Sure. Absolutely. And to be able to live in that environment that at any time this could happen, I think part of it, your body blocks out. Right. So and, you know, I think I, I always I always said that, you know, we are still leaving, we're living through the PTSD of the second intifada, which is why nothing right. has progressed. Now we have an even worse scenario. But the reason, the way you can live with these things is because you know that the state is, at the, that the army is powerful and that even if something happens, the army will respond. Then that you're basically protected, right? You know, and 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 the feeling. I think just the the effects of the feeling that the military was actually a lot less capable than we thought. We will definitely see the effects of that. I don't think that they're going to be very positive. Um, no, I I think we're seeing that now too, with the emphasis of too many want to retaliate in the most extreme yeah. fashion. Absolutely. And people feel they need to be personally armed. You know, there's there's a feeling of personal security. And, you know, I, and I have to say, I don't blame anybody for that because it is a dangerous situation. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's scary. And fear is never a good thing for peace. Yeah. Fear is what the conflict kind of thrives on. And I remember now I'm somebody who cannot step on a bug without feeling guilty and, oh my God, and... <laughs> It's a living thing. But when I was in the bomb shelters and I was looking at my 13-year-old son, the first thing you want to do is retaliate. As a parent, you want to protect your kids. But once I got home and returned to a more sane self, you know, more like who I really am, then I realized Palestinian parents want their kids also to play safely in their backyards. 
And uh, that's what made me work on peace. Yeah, it's a difficult situation. Anything else you want to say about what's going on? I think that that's it. I mean, as I said, these are these are really challenging times. And I think that the challenge is not just external, it's also internal. And I think for mm-hmm. a lot of people involved in the peace, it's very difficult to understand how we proceed from here. And, you know, as long as there are hostages there and so on, it's just, what do we, re- what do we really want? Do you see that there's any way that Israel, if they wanted to, that they could do something. I I understand they send leaflets and they always have, strangely enough, unlike all other countries who go to war, they always have tried to avoid harming people and notified them beforehand that they're going to bomb their house. They call them, they text them, they drop leaflets, which is so bizarre, but I don't think people here realize that. But so that's still going on. And, And I understand Hamas as always, has built the tunnels where they send the missiles from and get their supplies and now probably have hostages. They've always used their civilians as human shields. And so if Israel went after the tunnels because they're built under the hospitals and under schools and under mosques, uh, because Obviously, that looks really, really bad. But is there anything, not that you're a security expert, but is there anything that Israel can do to do more to avoid civilian casualties? I really don't think so at this point. I mean, you know, Israel has given the order for the people of northern, of the northern part of the Gaza Strip to move south. And so I think that that's the maximum. And Hamas has been not allowing people to move south. Yes, I know. It's clear to me that Hamas wants to bring the Gaza Strip to a humanitarian crisis, which would gain, you know, of course, international sympathy. And so, you know, that would, you know, get pressure on Israel to stop the attack. So I think really beyond what we have already done, there's unfortunate, I mean, it's a tragedy for the people of Gaza that they are hostages themselves at the at the hands of Hamas. The themselves are really the victims of their own terrible regime. Uh, and also the other Arab countries, Jordan and Egypt, from before when they left. They're still refugees, and now they won't open the gates to let them in. Egypt um, could definitely do more, for example, to make things easier in Gaza. I understand yeah. they have their own consideration, their own worries, but yes, sure. I, I don't think that Israel could do any more at this point, unfortunately. So that ends our discussion, and I want to thank Dr. Gideon Elazar for explaining to us, as an Israeli, how he feels during these first days of war. I want to reiterate killing of all types to me is anathema, but I do understand where Israel is coming from given the horrific slaughter of their citizens. I hope that Israel will continue to do everything they can to avoid harming any Gazan civilians, but I also realize that may not be possible as Hamas forces them to stay put using them as human shields. I also want to say that what's happening throughout the world the U.S. and in our communities with the extreme anti-Semitism and anti-Israel discourse is dangerous. I hope we will soon hear from more friends that they too support the rights of Jews to live safely in the United States. Before we go further, I wanted to clarify that if you had any doubts, Ruth Sharshim Juder is alive and well. I just received their newsletter filled with the news of January 2024 meetings of 180 Jewish and Arab youth meeting together and continue talks with the pre-military young people who will likely still be burdened to fight in this war. In the last nine years, Roots has spoken with 30,000 of them and so much more. It put a big smile on my face. How about you, L'chaim? Another interesting happening during 2023 was that we were asked by an organization called Challenge who founded the Federal Forum to interview their members who have developed a half dozen alternatives to the two-state peace plan. In 2023, we interviewed two of them and we have more scheduled for 2024. We'll hear an introduction to their proposals and the full interviews can be found on our Peace with Penny YouTube channel or on our website at www.pennystee.com.
Peace with Penny is not a political show, but we're always willing to speak about peace from many different directions. Between the contentious Israeli elections, the continued violence, and the two-state solution that seems dead, it may be hard to believe that there will ever be peace between Jewish Israelis and Palestinians. Yet, week after week on Peace with Penny, we show you that there are many people who work on peace between the two peoples every day. We just don't hear about it on the news. Next, we'll be speaking about something else you haven't heard about. If the two-state solution has not been realized since the 1930s, isn't it time to propose something else? There's been more than enough time to study what has worked in other countries. And the good news is there are a number of academicians who think they have the answer. The proposals are based on federation models. We'll be exploring two of the proposals that some believe is the answer to resolve this entrenched conflict. Periodically, we'll discuss others. The solutions are some configuration of a federation, like we have in the United States, Canada, Switzerland, or 25 other countries. It has worked for these countries, and they believe it can work for this small, viciously contested country in the Middle East. Of course, in this land, not everyone agrees on the exact formula that will work, but they've been willing to discuss their models. The first example that we'll discuss is called the Abrahamic movement. It has been said that if religion is part of the problem of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it must be part of the solution. This grassroots movement believes that we are the children of Abraham, both literally and in spirit. They believe that Avraham, Abraham, Ibrahim is the powerful unifying symbol that Jews, Christians, and Muslims can come together and agree upon. Today, we have the honor of speaking with Yoel Oz, who is the co-founder of the Abrahamic movement and the author of Abrahamic Federation, a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yoel, how would you describe the Abrahamic movement? We basically uh, have been promoting this idea of an Abrahamic Federation. Um, we are an educational as well as uh, political movement to some degree, where we promote the idea that a solution to the conflict uh, should work in terms of structure as a hybrid of something like the United States model, uh, where you would have states like New York and uh, New Jersey. Um, instead, you would have Israel and Palestine or the European Union model of uh, like France and Germany, and obviously there are many other countries in the European Union, obviously many other states in the United States as well, but the same kind of idea where we would be unified by a common symbol and spiritual uh, heritage, which uh, I've been writing and talking about this for about 10 years now, but uh, after the Abraham Accords uh, were coined and signed, in 2020 sort of confirmed uh, that the Abrahamic symbolism and uh, imagery and uh, idea and, and word um, resonate uh, for Jews and, uh, and Muslims as well as, as Christians throughout the Middle East. One of the things that I really liked is it seemed to honor both sides. And uh, that's obviously essential to get something to work. The, the notion that at the end of the day, I, I don't believe anyone is going anywhere. I don't think um, that they're not going to push us into the sea and we're not going to be driving them to Jordan. We are destined to live together in this land and that we have to figure out a way to make it work. I wrote my first book, Abrahamic Confederation, which I think I thought really as a model was more appropriate, that we're much more like the European Union than the United States. We, we have different languages, we have different uh, identities, different religions, and we're really, it's, it's not like in the United States where, you know, with New York and New Jersey, there is very little ethnic differences. Yes, there are differences between the blue states and the red states, and there was a civil war, and, but all of these things are the idea of having a greater political union uh, is something that the United States is grounded upon, but I don't think we're there yet, but that doesn't mean that we can't uh, have a broad association and work together. Found, what I found though, was that the same, when you, when you want to make a proposal, um, you need to make it simple enough, I think, for 
uh, a third grader, an eight year old, to be able to understand it. And the immediate question was, Oh, what that's why you say? came to me to pre help present it, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, no. <laughs> I figured it was the lowest common denominator. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, Ultimately, this is, I believe this is one land between the river and the sea, and there should be freedom of movement, um, and we should each be able to to go and visit, and they should be able to, you often hear, I said this, you know, see the sea. This is something you often hear from Palestinians. And for Jews to be able to go to visit, the resting places of uh, the forefathers and foremothers, uh, extremely moving and powerful. It should be in an ideal situation. Everything should be open. Today, we'll have our second in the series of interviews discussing different Federation proposals to try to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Amen. We have the honor of speaking with Emmanuel Shehoff, who serves as co-chair of the Federation movement. The Federation Movement promotes an equitable and modern federal state of Israel on the territory of the land of Israel between the Jordan River and the sea, not including the Gaza Strip. All inhabitants of the state will be equal citizens whose rights will be secured by a federal constitution. They'll be able to exercise their religious and cultural uniqueness in 30 cantons. The regional government in each canton will reflect the composition of the local population by which it was elected and will fulfill all the duties of government, not including national defense, foreign affairs, and other cross-cantonal duties, which are within the responsibility of the federal government in Jerusalem. Emmanuel was born in Germany and immigrated to Israel in 1972. He worked for 14 years in the office of the prime minister in Tel Aviv, serving in various positions at home and abroad. He has been a member and worked for the Labor Party since the early 1990s. He studied aeronautical engineering at the Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology, and has a bachelor's and master's of science and an MBA. Since 2014, Emmanuel has promoted a federation as a realistic approach to resolve the conflict with the Palestinians in the land of Israel. He recently published his autobiography, Identity, the Quest for Israel Future. Welcome, Emmanuel. Good to be here. Emmanuel, how would you describe the federation movement? Well, you read it out pretty nicely. It, it, it's it's um, um, a modern state, a, federate, a federal state, similar to 29 or, or almost 30 other federal countries in the world, with the re regional governments in, in regions or provinces or states or lender, however you call it, we call them cantons, based on the Swiss, Swiss model, giving uh, equal rights to every citizen and uh, local government. 75 years ago, the United Nations uh, General Assembly uh, voted on the partition proposal and voted in favor of partition of the area of, of the Palestine mandate uh, to, part, to divide it into two states. And uh, the Jewish part of the population uh, agreed to the division and the Palestinians did not. And ever since then, we've had this problem of divided or not divided, and the division has not been successful. Okay, Ever since it's, it started, uh, it wasn't successful. And it's not likely going to su succeed either. So the premise is that it, uh, th there will not be two states. There will only be one state in some kind of form. And the one we're proposing, the Federation, is likely going to be the, the better proposal. What I'd like to do is show a little clip, which uh, also has an overview of uh, your proposal. If the words, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, make you feel like going to sleep, you're not alone. Demonstrations, settlements, territories, people keep talking about it and nothing ever changes. The Israeli left wants peace, but the left leaders don't consider it a priority. The Israeli right doesn't like the present situation, but they really can't think of a better alternative. But the status quo is bad, both for Israelis and Palestinians. The conflict leads to terrorism and hurts Israel's relationships with other countries. Just ask Jews living outside Israel. But for Israelis, the most destructive thing about the conflict is the polarization and even hatred it leads to among Israelis. 
So if there's such a fundamental problem, why aren't we dealing with it? Because we've been taught for years that there are two possible solutions. Two states or one state. The two state solution seems impractical. It's hard to imagine that even a leftist government will be able to get hundreds of thousands of settlers out of the West Bank. The one state solution we've been told will make it impossible for Israel to remain a Jewish state. But instead of accepting a situation that's only getting worse, we need to look for new solutions. And we think our proposal is worth checking out. A federal union. A federal union or federation can accomplish two goals. Living together peacefully and not giving up what's most important to us. We suggest dividing Israel into 30 counties or cantons, like the northern canton in the Haifa region, the Ramallah and Sharon cantons in the center, and the Beersheba canton in the south. Each canton will be autonomous in things like the economy and education, so secular, religious, Jewish and Arab ways of life are protected. 60 new members will join the Knesset, our parliament, which will make sure that Israel remains a Jewish state. The Gaza Strip will not be part of the Federation. Hopefully its residents will appreciate the regional prosperity it offers, which will inspire them to choose peace so they can enjoy it too. We think the Israeli way is not to learn to live with problems, it's to think outside the box, improvise and solve them. Our plan has a lot more to it. Leading academics and security experts wrote a detailed document and we invite you to read it, comment and suggest improvements. Because if we can solve this issue, we can achieve anything. I wanted the ending segments of our third year anniversary celebration to be dedicated to the young, the kids who were born already with a job to do, to fix this unnecessary disaster that has caused so much pain and suffering. We'll be speaking with Gal Mosenson of the Nursery and Kindergarten School of En Bustan that operates in the field of bilingual and multicultural education according to the principles of Waldorf education. The founders of En Bustan share a vision of a society in which Jews and Arabs live together peacefully in equality and understanding. Amen. They believe in order to create this reality, there must be education that fosters true friendship, trust and shared culture and language. An educational system that separates children by their religion and nationality fails to take into consideration the widening gap between two communities, which will take years to bridge and generations to mend. The kindergarten and growing community center are taught in both Hebrew and Arabic, and are based on traditional arts and crafts, holidays and customs from Christian, Druze, Jewish and Muslim traditions. And Bustan educates children from a diverse array of socioeconomic, religious and cultural backgrounds. The children come from Kiryat Tivon, a Jewish town, and the surrounding Bedouin Arab villages, Hilf and Basmat Tabun. The families and faculty of in Bustan believe that children deserve to grow up in an environment enriched with the religious and ethnic folklore and traditions surrounding them. Cross-pollinating humanistic and Waldorf approaches to education with a multicultural genre is a critical way to prepare children for the complex world in which they live. Gal Mosenson's association with in Bustan started in 2012 when her daughter went to school there and has worked at in Bustan since 2014 and is in charge of fundraising and public relations. Her father also has volunteered at in Bustan for many years and they like to say that their daughter graduated but she and her father stayed in kindergarten. So on that note of dedication, let's begin. Welcome, Gal. Hey, hello. <laughs> How would you describe En Bustan? I think you basically nailed it. You said it all. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> basically, we look at En Bustan as an initiative for social change. It surrounds our nursery and our kindergarten mm -hmm. because we believe that the change needs to start with the children. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that we do it through bringing to the social change happens when you bring the communities together, communities who don't have a lot of interactions with one another. And uh, through these interactions, and especially in an early age, you create the change because uh, 
um, when people get to know one another, there are less differences between us. Yeah, and I think Rabbi Sachs says, the more that I get to meet the other, the more I realize we're the same. Exactly. So um, before we go further, I wanted to share a little clip because I think it, it does a great job explaining about your school. Shalom and Salam from En Bustan in Israel. My name is Gal, and I live in the town of Kiryat Ivon. I'm a photographer, and I do the resource development and public relations for En Bustan, a Jewish Arab nonprofit organization for social change that works in the field of bilingual and multicultural education based on the principles of Waldorf education. The association's goal is to bring people together and to serve as a bridge between the Arab and Jewish neighboring populations in order to build together a society based on shared life and peace. Our kindergarten and nursery are located in Khilf, a small Bedouin village near Kiryat Yvon. As is the Waldorf tradition, it is our goal to give the 45 children attending our kindergartens the opportunity to explore the world. They do so through spending time outside in nature, as well as indoors, with activities such as sewing, painting, crafts, eurythmia, and musical education, and most important, by just freely playing. In Enbustan, we speak both Hebrew and Arabic, celebrate both Jewish and Muslim holidays because we want to share and celebrate our different backgrounds with one another. We refer to ourselves as a community because there is much more to Enbustan than just the kindergartens, as we organize and encourage activities which are open also to the wider community and help bring together and promote dialogue and understanding between the Jewish and Arab neighboring communities. Activities such as ladies' nights, study groups, classes, listening circles, lectures, cultural events, and joint family activities <laughs> like hikes, picnics, storytelling, and more. Your support helps us make all this a reality as the families of Enbustan are also mixed in their financial capabilities, it is important for us to be able to offer scholarships for some of the children whose families are in need of financial aid. This is where your contribution to Enbustan goes. We are grateful for you, as your help allows us to keep our doors open for all who want to share this journey with us. Thank you, Todaba and Shukran. And if you are wondering what's happened at the school since October 7th, we've spoken with them and they said they were able to reopen their nursery and kindergarten within a few weeks from the beginning of the war, once they managed to modify their safe rooms according to the current requirements. As a parent, I can't imagine what that is like, sending your child to school during war. Finally, I wanted to show a clip from another organization that we've interviewed in the past called Regeneration Education, who also works with Enbustan. Their mission asserts that they want to advance peace building through innovative approaches to the education, development, and resilience of young children in crisis zones, so they are able to imagine and create a better future. Many children, especially those in Israel and the West Bank, are affected by toxic stress. Violent conflict and poverty are the most common culprits. Toxic stress harms a child's life in many ways, brain development, academic achievement, mental and physical health. Even their likelihood of committing violent crimes increases. Perhaps the most tragic side is the stalled development of empathy, a foundation for peace building. How do you raise a child in a place that's full of trauma to feel that they have the same chance at happiness and well-being that every other child in the world does. Oh, 
after a night that you don't sleep and your children was afraid and there was a bomb and a siren. Uh, it's more than any film you can make up. The trauma, the insecurity of a society in which warfare is always at the brink, in which there could be a bomb or a rocket or this or that, you know, that's just, it's, it's tangible. They always say, I cannot remember. I cannot remember. It is as everything goes in and out, and I have no access to my body. And the children will ask you, why we are shot by gun? Why are we are facing this uh, war? You can see the kids are a little bit uh, more intense. How do you educate people past their fear and anger? The fear has a physiological process, and this is why children who are afraid have difficulty learning and remembering. The aggression comes out of his shattered nerve system. What is my task in a conflict area is to show my children there are more ways than what they are usually as shown by the TV or the public. Not talking about what kind of Arab are you, are you Muslim or a Christian, what kind of Jew are you, where have you arrived from, it doesn't matter. It's so essential to begin with the youth, it's only later these ideas are pumped into our heads that we're different. كيرش إنه الولد هذاك بمره مرحلة اللي هي مرحلة أهم مرحلة في حياته بالجيل هذا. Because we know that when children experience those years in a healthy way, then they go into their elementary school and their their whole. We want them to 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 grow up and feel a natural way to be to belong, just to belong to this place. يعني التعليم إلى ما لا نهاية أهم إشي التعليم وشي سلاح الإنسان اللي هي شهادته Our hope is in educating our children in such a way that they see forgiveness and compassion and understanding and redemption and healing as every bit as important is math and science Today almost every place in the kind of conflict area. So the solution that the educators here develop can be taken to heal other places. If we work with the young children now, then we stop the war 20 years from now. In this way, it has to be done in this very moment. You can't wait for the politicians. Let's do it, don't wait. And we can do it right here and now. If you would like to donate to Peace with Penny or, or help in any way, please contact Peace with Penny at penny at penny, the letter S, T E E dot com. Or if you would like to contribute to any of these fantastic peace organizations, they all have websites where you can help support them. You will be able to find their full interviews on, on the Peace with Penny YouTube channel or at www.penny, the letter S, T E E dot com. During these difficult times, I'm sure they would especially appreciate your help. Any questions, contact me. Next week, we will be speaking with Yoav Peck, a Jewish-Israeli peace activist. Yoav Peck lives in Jerusalem, raised in New York. He's lived in Israel for 50 years. He's an organizational psychologist specializing in systemic programs for the advancement of human dignity. Yoav has been active in human rights and peace work for most of his adult life holding managerial positions in three peace organizations over the past 12 years. He's currently director of capacity building for the Challenge NGO, which is engaged in conflict transformation and founded the federal forum that we've previously mentioned in our recap. The entire world seems to be hurting. 
whether from war, hunger, disease, or just life, there is too much stress for everyone. Psychologically, the suffering seems endless. And so, as promised, I'll play for you Michael Hunter Oaks' A Song for Healing, Rafua Shlema, in the hopes that it will provide some comfort, as only music can. For celebrating our third year anniversary with us, and we hope you enjoyed learning about these incredible organizations. If you missed any episodes with Peace with Penny, please check out our library of interviews, which can be found on our Peace with Penny YouTube channel or at www.penny, the letter S, T E E.com under podcasts. We pray that the wars currently waging will end soon and that children everywhere will again enjoy a childhood full of love, play, and safety. Amen. May you live in peace, shalom, and salam.